double-decker bridge, the most unusual in Australia. Spanning the Clarence River between Grafton and South Grafton, it's a vital link for transport between Sydney and Brisbane. Vehicles take the high road and the trains take the low road, but neither will be in Scotland before you. The bridge was originally designed only for the railway, but plans were altered before building began. That's why rail approaches are straight and the road curves in on giant concrete spans. In the control tower, lift span operator Arthur Edwards pulls the lever which opens the bridge to allow ships to pass. So delicate is the balance that the actual lift takes only one minute. From the moment traffic gates close, all movements are precision timed and interlocked, so there's no possibility of accident. The bridge is 1,510 feet long, and steelwork and the concrete highway weigh 6,000 tons. Its efficiency is a tribute to planners who are not afraid to be unorthodox. A bridge unique in Australia, one of the few of its kind in the world. Jacaranda time in Grafton, the city of colour on the north coast of New South Wales. And Jacaranda time means more than glorious blossoms. It's time for gaiety, for singing and dancing. Here's a community spirit other cities could follow, a cooperative effort, as all Grafton joins the festival of the Jacaranda. No festival would be complete without its procession, and this procession wouldn't be complete without Bill Chatterway, Jacaranda Bill, who founded the festival 15 years ago. So Grafton celebrates with dancing, tiny tots around the maypole. Men and women, boys and girls in the market square. Folk dancing to celebrate a festival that's become famous. No one too old to dance, no one too young. Just as long as you're gay and carefree. Oi, corn on the hoof. They dance all morning and they dance all afternoon. What, more of them? Yes, Grafton sets a new high in festive merriment with a week that has its climax in the crowning of the Jacaranda Queen. This year, the lucky girl is Faye Schaefer, Queen for one whole year. At the showground on an illuminated dais, she receives the coveted crown. And then, since the night's still young, Grafton goes right on dancing. <laughs> Thank you. 
Grafton's famous jacarandas, Christ Church Cathedral is the scene of a special service attended by the Archbishop of Sydney. More than 80 years after the laying of the foundation stone, Bishop Clements, 5th Bishop of Grafton, is to consecrate the cathedral. The huge crowd which overflows the service sees an impressive procession of bishops and clergy. Inside is a fragment of stone from the 800-year-old Norman Abbey of St. Augustine, Canterbury. But the cathedral is rich in Australian history too, for it was built under the supervision of the Reverend Charles Greenway, a son of the famous architect. An historic building consecrated at last. Grafton, city of jacarandas, celebrates the 21st birthday of its jacaranda festival. And what a 21st birthday it is. The whole city dances as the festival celebrates its coming of age. Dancing in the parks and in the streets. The cars can wait because the traffic cops are probably dancing too. Happy Jack Martins arrived from Brisbane. 75 but as hep as any. Australia needs more festivals like this one and more of the community pride and spirit that makes them possible. The Jacaranda has made Grafton famous in many lands and our people come from far and wide to join in the celebrations. Everyone sings and dances for Grafton's festival is 21 today. by more than 30 inches of rain on its large catchment area, the Richmond River floods into Lismore, northern New South Wales. Fortunately, the rain eased just as the water was approaching record high levels. More than 100 families were cut off by floodwaters in areas upriver from Lismore, and one man lost his life. Farms on the rich river flat were inundated and crops lost. Cattle and horses were marooned. Many stock owners, however, anticipating that the river would go on a rampage, moved their beasts to safety. Some got away only just ahead of the floodwater. The water rose and swept over low-lying roads with alarming rapidity. In another 15 minutes of rising water, this road will be dangerous. The main business section of Lismore escaped damage, but houses near the river had foundations submerged. Rivers stay away from our door. Lismore's damage, serious enough, might have been disastrous had the river risen another few feet. havoc in the wake of the worst flood disaster in the history of the New South Wales North Coast. 23 people died. Hundreds of valuable cattle were drowned. Homes were swept bodily away. Millions of pounds worth of damage was done. Now these stricken people are struggling to start all over again. That takes courage. This house was swept half a mile across the town of Lismore. Overall, lies the sickening stench of death. Cattle losses have been appalling and most of the carcasses were swept to sea. Foul mud and slime covers everything. Paddocks, roads, the interiors of houses, shops, churches, and ever present is the threat of disease. A span of the bridge at Casino was torn out by a wall of water 30 feet high. But already gangs are on the job making temporary repairs, but traffic must move. Loosened hay has been flown in and is distributed to starving cattle. Grafton cleans up. Damage here was fortunately far less serious than at Lismore, Casino and Kordakai. The now dry Gollan Hotel Lismore, which ten days before the flood sheltered the Queen and the Duke for a night they still can find a smile. Shop girls washed out damaged goods that must be sold at sacrifice prices. Storekeepers lost tens of thousands of pounds worth of stock. Hams and meat polluted by the river must be disposed of. According to the mayor of Lismore, there is over a quarter of a million pounds worth of food, new furniture and clothing, bags of grain and other goods dumped on this tip. Devastation in the wake of a flood. Only the people who lived through it can know its real horror.
Lithgow may claim Marjorie Jackson as a hometown girl, but more than 5,000 people at Coffs Harbour turn out to show the world's record-breaking sprinter that they haven't forgotten that she was born right here. Marjorie gets a real welcome at her original home. She was born here 21 years ago on September the 13th. Of course, that palm was only a seed in those days. Incidentally, another Australian sporting star, Davis Cup player Mervyn Rose, was born in the same street. Bananas in wintertime, eh? But this is the tropical north. At the Anzac Park Cenotaph, Australia's most famous young woman accompanies the local president of the Returned Soldiers League to lay a wreath. Marjorie is accompanied to Coffs Harbour by her parents and sister Beryl, and they and local residents see the Olympic champion in a role usually reserved for those too old to run. Oh well, it's one way of keeping fit. Marge is a girl who gets around, fast. If she hadn't sprinted south to become the Lithgow Flash, she might have been the Coffs Comet. There's going to be some lion stories round Coffs Harbour for a long time. But two more and the elephant took off for the wide open spaces. Residents took off for cover. In daylight, one of the lions was quickly discovered and the walls and fences of Coffs Harbour weren't high enough for most citizens. He wants to be a lion tamer when he grows up. That is, if he grows up. The lion killed 30 prize fowls, ate only part of one. The rest are suffering from nervous prostration, so is the owner. Police and army men who had been attending a ball were armed with 303 rifles and joined in the hunt. But what do you do with a lion when he just sits and stares? City Sound's on-the-spot cameraman, Jack Girard, was grateful for the chance to make close-ups. We're worried about his insurance. They captured Rill the elephant and she decided to go quietly. Fancy mislaying an elephant for eight hours. Then they got after the really big game. The two lions were cornered on a beach and circus men quickly erected a huge 50-foot cage. Most nervous people in the whole show were the circus men. They feared some trigger-happy hunter would bump off their valuable lions. Excitement runs high as the lions are herded towards the big cage. At this stage, residents of the more outlying districts were beginning to come down from the trees. Fortunately, the lions had been fed just before the accident and seemed to have no particular interest in rump steak, human and on the hoof. One in and one to go. And here's the second. Well, howdy, pal. Quite a night, wasn't it? The sigh of relief could be heard as far south as Melbourne. Back to the old routine, for the greatest show on earth must go on. All the lions are recaptured. Everybody's happy. Except him. He hasn't heard yet. The coronation in a typical country town. At Cobbs Harbour in northern New South Wales, townspeople, although there are only 6,000 of them, are not to be outdone by the big spectacle of the cities. They hold their own coronation procession. And it is okay, too. There are floats, flags and bunting. Loyalty and real affection are as widespread as this vast con... Spring and spring go hand in hand at Lismore on the northern New South Wales coast. And to welcome spring, there's a floral show that literally makes it a city of flowers. Orchids, lovely tropical blooms, are prize exhibits in a show where every flower deserves a prize. No need for hothouses up here either. And now the parade of the blooms. Floats that reflect the beauty of spring laden with every type of flower and blossom. Even the council trucks help make it roses, roses all the way. And what's a festival without a queen? A rival to the beauty of the blooms themselves. And here she is, Lismore's Queen of Spring, crowned in a festival of flowers.
linking the rich New England tablelands with the coast, the new 74-mile-long Guida Highway, incorporating seven high-level bridges and two huge culvert-type crossings. On official opening day, guests assemble at a point roughly halfway along the highway as local member of parliament, Lieutenant Colonel Bruxner, makes an address of welcome to Premier Heffron. To Mrs. Heffron falls the honour of cutting the ribbon. The biggest state road construction yet undertaken, the Guida Highway represents a two million pound investment in the future of the area. center of a prosperous district on the northern tableland of New South Wales is Tenterfield, with a history dating back to the year 1840. Today it is a modern town with an increasing population and confident plans for long-range future development. Tenterfield evidences the natural contrast of the new and the old. Proud link with Federation is the building where a speech by Sir Henry Park set into motion a movement that laid the foundations of the Commonwealth of Australia. The timber industry has always been an important one in the district, and on the eastern slopes of the Great Dividing Range, there are fine stands of hard and soft wood trees. A program of reforestation is continually replacing the used timber. Production is around a million super feet a year, making regular employment for timber fellers, tractor and truck drivers, and many others. Forest giants on their way to serve a nation. The apple of any little boy's eye is an orchard, but here they are mouth-watering peaches picked and handled gently to reach some lucky person's table without a blemish. The result of ample and regular rainfall bringing richness to soil which has never suffered the pangs of drought. One of the youngest and most interesting industries in the area is concerned with tobacco growing, which is mostly produced on a share farm basis by migrant workers. With continuing success, it is expected that the crops will eventually become worth more than a million pounds annually. After picking comes grading and tying onto racks in preparation for the curing process. Curing is an operation requiring skill and experience. The tobacco is hung in barns, protected from rain and dampness, and in this case is subjected to heating through these ground-level flues. The time taken in this process varies considerably, but it is generally accepted that the longer and more gradual it is, the better the result. Today, in common with other men on the land, the tobacco farmer uses modern methods to protect his crop. Modern methods that are assisting the growth of the Tenterfield area, a district with a wealth of history and a certain future.
of Moree in northwest New South Wales is another town like Ellis where they shrug off the lack of a sea breeze in the Olympic pool. But it's the artesian baths which have been a major tourist attraction since 1895. The warm bore water is claimed to have great therapeutic value. Moree is one inland centre of Australia where a little help from nature puts a warming break on the winter freeze. The bubbling waters from the Moree Bore are always at 110 degrees. If you're on the other side of 50, the mineral waters give you the urge to throw away those walking aids for good. And as any local bird watcher will confirm, there's something about Moree that really buoys you up. Inverell district in northern New South Wales, an area rich in gemstones. 
This is a sapphire field run by Bernie Gorkroger and they use a lot of mechanical equipment to find the semi-precious stones. The earth is scooped up and deposited in a dump, soil, sapphires and all. Then water is sprayed on the dirt to separate the soil from the rock and stones. The soil is washed away down the sluices. Australia is rich in gemstones and they're widely distributed. There are a lot of them in this district too, but Inverell has long been noted for the quality of its sapphires and that's what they're after here today. The gemstones of course are heavier than the soil around them, but they're not appreciably different from pieces of rock and stone. The water under pressure washes away the soil and leaves the heavier material. The prospectors hope that this material has plenty of sapphires in it. And this is where the expert comes in, throwing the heavy material out and picking the valuable stones from it. That's a sapphire in its natural state, and who knows what it could be worth. The rough sapphire bears little resemblance to the finished product. This brooch, for instance, is worth $710. And here at Proud's is a girl wearing a bracelet worth $4,400 and a ring valued at $2,500. There are $26,000 in this display. The star sapphire in the center, $4,500 alone. A small fortune in glittering jewelry. For banana lovers, this is heaven. It's Coffs Harbour, a rich, thriving town on the north coast of New South Wales, where they harvest the biggest percentage of the country's banana crop. Coffs Harbour just makes it as a land airport, for the airstrip is a mere 10 feet above sea level. Coffs itself is more than a banana growing area. Excellent harbour facilities help secondary industry, and the fine beaches and reasonable cost of living attract anyone who wants to be there to live the good life. Generally, bananas are grown on hillsides to avoid damaging effects of frost. Plastic bags are also protective and help to fill up the fruits while still on the tree. Once a year, they hold the Kofsana Smorgasbord. This is what it looks like before the local and visiting gourmets get to work on it. A hundred or more tempting dishes, each of them having bananas as a basic ingredient. No wonder they call this bit of Australia the top banana country. Even if you don't like bananas, it still looks pretty good.